out, you know, you know, did she have subway fare? <laughs> you know, and you know, we, you know, historians don't write about things like that. You know, we just kind of presume and hope, you know, that she was able to keep the bulldog fed and you know get from one end. <laughs> you know, she was yeah. married to non-musicians, so maybe that. Uh, well, yes, that's true. Right. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> in there, and um, I don't know if I got a chance to mention that in one of those books, the newspaper um, binder, the binder with the newspaper articles, mm -hmm. and it's from the Washington Post, and she said that she took any job that she could possibly yeah. take oh, yeah. in order to make, make ends yeah. meet, I did so that she could do what she like wanted, to, yeah, wanted to do, which was oh, yeah. compose music. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So. Yeah. And, uh, well, it really just reflects much of how we <laughs> get from week to week, too. Mm -hmm. And I guess even when um, I learned that Duke Ellington, you know, when his band was on the road, one of the things that kept his band on the road was that, one, he was able to live off of the royalties from the publication mm -hmm. of music that he wrote back in the 30s with mm -hmm. Irving Mills, but also he was not above playing a week at the Rainbow Room in New York City and then hitting the road and going to Oklahoma to play some high school prom, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, during the 50s, as many of the big bands were going belly up, he even played, I think there's a, I think in the American Masters documentary about Ellington, there's footage of him playing as accompaniment, the band played accompaniment water show, like a water and light show, um, synchronized swimming, you know. <laughs> and I mean, we look back on that and think, block the nerve, you know. No, oh, hey, are they paying? Because, <laughs> I mean, you know, and, you know, he, uh, you know, he, you know, when you, when you study Ellingtoni, you'll find a lot of fascinating things that, again, you know, in the moment, you know, a lot of us professionally would have walked, but you know, he found found ways, made ways to keep the band working. You know, and to Margaret Bonds on an individual on a smaller uh, scale level, as far as personnel was concerned, did the same thing. And plus, Tim Pan Alley had a lot to do with encouraging young writers to sure. to write sure. American music. We need to mm -hmm. we need to write here in America. Yeah, it is interesting, also. Alethea, I bet you probably came across this <coughs> fact in your research. She, uh, she and I believe Nathaniel Dett, there were a number of African American composers that approached Nadia Boulanger mm -hmm. asking yes. to study, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and she turned them away. Yeah. 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 Not because they were black, but yeah. because she thought that they had what they needed right. already. Yeah. Exactly. And that Again, I need, a, I need a forklift to get my jaw up off the floor yeah. <laughs> when you consider that Aaron Copeland and Leonard Bernstein right. Right. and Quincy Jones and an office health store studied with Nadia. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so what does that mean? You don't know. It may mean everything. It may mean nothing. But, again, it, you know, it reminds me of the quote of Maurice Ravel to George Gershwin when Gershwin asked to study orchestration with Ravel, and Ravel told him, it would be better that you're a first-rate Gershwin than a second-rate Ravel. Mm. <laughs> yeah, again, you just gotta take that and keep rolling. You know, I mean, it's, a, it's the best of left-handed compliments. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, unless there are other questions or comments, we should, we should hasten onward as this uh, Teddy Roosevelt might say. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much.